All right, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, and you guys are going to let me know if somebody tries to check, because you'll see it, and I won't, I think. But um, basically what we'll do is we'll try to keep it kind of informal. I'm going to try to stand here. I tend to walk around a lot. Um, although there's only two people out here, so. But I'll try to stand here so people online can see. But basically what we're, I'm going to talk about is a bounce program that I have going on here. Um, it's actually right now going for students, but I'm going to start offering it to the uh, adult population, essentially. So I'm going to spend a little bit about, little today about telling you how to eat healthy, and then at the end, not just eat healthy, but stress. Um, I'm actually changing the whole program to encompass all the dimensions of wellness. And so um, this particular program now for the students and for the faculty and staff is going to be designed more around staying overall healthy and improving your wellness. So for some of you guys that don't know me, I know a couple of you online. Um, Amy Bidwell, professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Wellness. And I teach this class actually as a first year signature course as a pilot program for our freshmen. And then I've offered it, let's see, I think probably two and a half years where we've collected data on how students have progressed and how they, you know, lost weight or gained weight or didn't gain weight, which is really important for freshmen to not gain weight. Um, and then this semester we really took it one step further and really focused on time management and stress management. Okay, so let me just take a little bit through not necessarily the program, but just some tips from the program of how to stay healthy overall. There we go. Okay, so you know, there's this, this question, there's always this question of, you know, what keeps you healthy? Or if from a weight perspective, is it calories in versus calories out? Are all calories the same? There's a ton of stuff about the ketogenic diet right now. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, there's also a lot of information on sugar, and that's what my, my PhD was actually all on sugar metabolism and physical activity. And just to kind of give you a little bit of an interesting story about my dissertation, we took 20 college students that were active individuals, so they had to be at least exercising four days a week. And we put them, we gave them two sodas a day, so two sprites. It's actually like in this W pop or whatever. Two 20 ounce sprites a day. It equaled about 400 calories. And then friend um, equaled about 400 calories. And then they worked with a dietitian to eliminate 400 calories, so they were calorically even when they had the sodas. And what we did is we made them become inactive for two weeks while drinking the soda. So they were inactive and they had accelerometers. We had the fancy accelerometers. This was before Fitbits and all that. Um, and they could only exercise, they could only walk 4,500 steps a day. And actually that was a challenge for them because they're at the Syracuse um, University campus. So. It was tough. I actually had to drive some of them around in a golf cart, which was fun. Um, so I got stuck in the snow once. But anyways, um, so they did the two sodas a day for two weeks while being inactive. And then they came back, and we took a whole bunch of blood measurements before and after. They came back two weeks later, and we gave them two weeks off to go back to their normal life. Um, same activity, whatever activity they wanted, whatever diet they wanted, just they, we didn't necessarily want them to gain weight. They came back two weeks later after their washout period, and we did the exact same thing. We took a bunch of blood, and then we gave them two sodas again. And this time, we had them be physically active. So they had to be at least 12,500 uh, 12, steps a day, which really wasn't hard for these guys because they exercised regularly. So what we were looking at was, one, what would happen with the sugar intake with these college students that aren't necessarily super healthy to begin with. So with, just generally speaking, from the time that they started the sugar to the time that they um, stopped it in that two-week period when they were inactive, 
their cholesterol, so within that two week period, they did not gain any weight. So we watched their weight, we, they worked with a dietitian, gained no weight. Their blood lipid, their triglyceride levels, went up 118% in two weeks in 18 year olds. Like, oh, they're probably like 18 to 20 year olds when they were inactive. So then, after the washout period and they were active the second time, although it was a crossover design, um, their, their triglycerides still increased 40%, even being active. So the take home message was sugar is really, really bad. Physical activity is helpful, but it's not going to negate it completely. And it's not necessarily about calories in versus calories out because their calories changed, their weight also remained the same the whole entire time. So their weight didn't change, but yet these healthy young individuals with normal cholesterol, their triglyceride levels went up 118%. So just kind of a, a, I like to kind of tell that story because it shows you that, yes, we are consuming more calories, but if you're looking from like a, a weight loss perspective, it's not necessarily just about dropping calories, okay? What those calories are made of makes a huge difference. So, um, and, and what this figure is really showing you is that, you know, over the course of the last 40, 50 years, yes, we've increased our caloric intake um, by about 425 calories, which is about a pound. If you were to ingest an extra 425 calories a day for one week, you'd gain about a pound, okay? Because you, um, it takes about 3,500 excess calories a week to gain one pound, okay? All right, and then stop, please stop me as I go if you have questions, especially for the people online. So does it, would it therefore make sense that if you decrease your calories by $3,500? <laughs> for the week you would lose a pound? So theoretically, yes. If you decreased your caloric intake by 500 calories a day for seven days, you'd lose a pound. But why doesn't that happen always? Right. And that's what we can talk about. But basically, the way you look at it is the more weight you have to lose, the easier it is to just monitor calories. But as you get closer to your goal weight, it's no longer calories and versus calories out. So for instance, if, you're, if you do like a MyFitnessPal, and you record your diet and you're supposed to have 1,200 calories, if you ate 1,200 calories, if you had to lose 50 pounds and you ate 1,200 calories, you'll lose weight no matter what, even if those 1,200 calories are a full pizza. However, one, you're not gonna become any healthier, which we'll talk about later, but as you get closer to your goal weight, so now you're at 20 pounds or less, the body starts to adjust to that, so it's no longer can you just get away with focusing on calories. You now have to focus on what those calories are. And that's why, you know, yes, obesity is an issue in our society, but what's actually more of an issue is being overweight. Okay, so we have this group of individuals, about 30% of the population that's considered obese. Okay, and there's a lot of factors. There are genetic, genetic factors, there's a lot of factors. But we've got 66% of the population that is just overweight. And I say just because it, it's easy to fix, okay? And the way to fix that is to keep people from becoming overweight to begin with. <clears throat> and so the balance program focuses on preventing weight gain to begin with, but then if you do have weight to lose, you know, how we monitor that. And you know, what you do versus what you do are gonna be completely different. Um, and that's why, like, for me, thank you. For me, if I even look at a carbohydrate, I'll gain weight. I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it's just, that's how I am. And it's interesting because, you know, people kind of mock the whole genetic thing, but there is a huge, huge genetic link between obesity and um, being not obese. But not only that, there's actually a genetic marker linked to what type of exercise your body can actually do to lose weight and what type of foods your body actually needs to lose weight. And that's why some people can lose weight on a 75% calorie from carbohydrate diet and some people need 10% because there's a genetic composition there, the genetic change. So, um, and that's what the nice thing about bounce is 
it's not a one-size-fits-all. So if you were to go into like a Weight Watchers, it tends to be a one-size-fits-all. And I'm actually a fan of Weight Watchers. I do think Weight Watchers is good if you have a lot of weight to lose, it gets you going. But once you get closer to that goal weight, it gets a little bit harder to manipulate. And I already kind of talked about this already, um, as far as the sugar and the calories. So as we've kind of moved through the last few decades, our increase in caloric, uh, calories have increased, but what's interesting is our sugar has increased as well, okay? And this is almost outdated. It is no doubt outdated now because what we see now, if you were to continue this high fructose corn syrup trend, what we see is it's actually starting to drop. So less and less people are consuming high fructose corn syrup because in the past 10 years or so, five years or so, we learned how terrible high fructose corn syrup is. What do you think they're replacing it with? Sugar. Well, like other like there's a brown rice syrup that's become more popular. Yeah, other syrups, right? a lot of other sugars is essentially what they're doing. So high fructose corn syrup, and my, my whole research was on high fr fructose corn syrup, but it's not the high fructose corn syrup that's bad. It's the fructose that's attached to the high fructose corn syrup that's bad. And all these replacements, something as simple as all natural sugar, table sugar, still has fructose and once it's digested is what makes it bad. Now as you're thinking in your mind, well what about fruit? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. We're not necessarily referring to fruit, although it's fructose, but what we're referring to is large concentrations of sugar. So a soda. Generally speaking, you shouldn't be getting more than about 20 to 25 grams of added sugar a day, no matter where that sugar comes from. Brown sugar, white sugar, sugar, purple sugar, whatever sugar it is. You shouldn't be eating more than about 25 grams, okay? As you consume more and more, and I'll be honest with you, you could eat, a, have a glass of orange juice, a bagel, and a banana for breakfast, and you're probably at 40 grams, okay? So it doesn't take much to get over 25 grams. Um, my daughter probably eats it in one serving of cereal, okay? What happens is all that extra sugar gets metabolized into our liver and turns into lipids, fats, triglycerides. And that's what I started with my research where we took this cohort of individuals and gave them soda. It, would the same thing would have happened if we gave them fruit juice. The same thing would have happened if we gave them Lipton all natural iced tea, okay? Because it's such a large dose of sugar all at once, okay? So, you know, a couple of decades ago, the bad guy was like bad cholesterol mm -hmm. and, and all that. But it seems like the bad guys really seem to have turned into sugar. It is 100% sugar. And that's why I am so, I, I would say the biggest take home message would be a calorie is not a calorie. Which means that you could have 100, 1200 calories of sugar versus 1200 calories of like a mixed diet, and you will no doubt gain weight with 1200 calories of sugar because it gets metabolized as lipids, as fats, okay? Uh, what else did I wanna say about that? I think that's about it, um, but the rule of thumb is, um, you know, just be careful what's in your food, but I would say more so what's in your drinks. Um, juice, I, I'm teaching my nutrition class online right now, and I asked my students as a discussion question, what do you got, what are the top three most commonly um, consume drinks that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would say 80% of them all said, and then they had to talk about what's good and what's bad. And they had a rank on. And they all had fruit juice in there. Because you know, that's what we grew up. You grew up drinking your juice and your milk. And they were so shocked for me when I, so surprised when I went on the discussion board and said, well, actually, no, you don't want the fruit juice. Um, and everyone's like, well, the vitamins, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, that's great, but you just have a piece of fruit. Have a whole piece of fruit. Because if you have an eight ounce glass of orange juice, it would be equivalent to ingesting about 10 to 15 oranges in one sitting. I'm guessing no one's really gonna do that. Maybe you do, I don't know. It's a lot of oil. Yes, <laughs> um, so you don't need that much. And you know what it is, is the, the vitamins that you're getting from that one orange, plus you know maybe some leafy green vegetables throughout the day, is more than enough, okay? Um, you don't have to drink that juice. If you do have juice, I would have about four ounces and then the rest with water. Um, but 
I really, I, there's no need for juice. If you can eat a whole fruit. If you can't eat a whole fruit, um, take a multivitamin, and I'm not a big fan of that either, but that's for another day. <laughs> but really, you don't need juice. Okay, so, um, you know, this that goes kind of to what we're saying. Is it just too much food, too little exercise? No, <laughs> it's not. If it were that easy, we wouldn't have the issue that we have, have okay? Um, it is, again, if you're 50, 60, 70 pounds overweight, you will no doubt lose weight if you decrease your calories and increase your physical activity. To a point, but it's not going to last and it's not going to be, um, you'll never get to that goal weight that you need to get to because what the composition of your diet is, is really what makes the big difference, okay? With the exercise, I'm an exercise physiologist, and I will be the first to tell you that you cannot lose weight with exercise. Everybody thinks, well, it's January 1st. In fact, I was at the gym this morning, and I'm so busy, and I'm so annoying. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> I just wanted to tell all these people, just relax. Let's focus on your diet first. 80% of weight loss is diet. 80% of weight maintenance is exercise okay so to lose the weight you need to monitor your change your diet and get a little exercise in no doubt but then once you get to your goal weight the key is not exercise because exercise helps to maintain your weight because as i said before you need 500 calories to lose a, um, a deficit a day for seven days to lose a pound a week and a pound in most obese individuals' minds probably isn't a lot of weight loss in a week. If you wanted to just exercise that off, you would have to run five to six miles a day every day. How many of you guys want to do that? I didn't think so. So when instead you do some exercise, maybe you burn a few exercises for 30, 40 minutes, maybe you burn 150, 200 calories. You don't ever go by the calories on the machine, they're way off. Um, maybe 150 to 200 calories, and then with your diet, you create like another 300, 400 calorie deficit. Which, if you're like a soda drinker, that's a piece of cake. Just take a soda out. Um, so it's a little easier to manipulate your diet than it is for exercise. And I'm, I'm the first one to tell you that I'm probably the only person that has ever ran. I, um, I trained for a half marathon to lose weight, and I gained five pounds. Because the more I exercised, the more I ate. And I was at the gym at 5.45 this morning, and as I was walking from um, park to here, I was thinking, oh, what am I gonna have for lunch? I looked out this morning, I can eat that. So we trick ourselves, okay? So don't you, exercise is super important, but it can't be the only reason why you're trying to lose weight. With that being said, um, 90s, I think it's something like 97% of individuals that have bariatric surgery within five years have gained weight back. And I have um, a sister. Like any kind? Because there's like a lap band. There's a lot of different ones. Right. Any, just, just in general, different. bariatric surgery wow. within five years. And I will tell you anecdotally from my research, as far as just family members that have had it, I had an uncle that actually died from it because he ended up starving himself to death. So that was one extreme. And then um, a sister and brother-in-law that both did it. My sister should never have had it done. She was probably 15 pounds heavier than me. So she's fine. And then my brother-in-law needed it, and he did great, and he's gained almost all his weight back. Um, he is, they don't exercise. Okay, and that's one of the issues with bariatric surgery is um, you're just taking the stimulus away temporarily. You're not teaching them anything. And I would say the main thing with my bounce program, which I'll talk about at the end, the main thing is behavior change. You, have, you can't go on a fad diet. I will tell you now, that if I told you guys to go on a ketogenic diet starting this, right this second and then come back to me in a month, I guarantee you will have lost a ton of weight. I'll guarantee that you're going to be miserable, <laughs> and I guarantee that six months from now you're going to be heavier than you were today. Okay? So, yes, these fat diets work, but they don't create a behavior change. Okay? So the key is... You know, I can say, don't eat carbohydrates, eat carbohydrates. Well, if you're a really big carbohydrate eater, and I say, don't eat any, it's not going to last. Okay? Um, but, again, incorporating physical activity is important, but just know that it can't be your main 
tool. Um, comfort foods, there was something on the news, and I missed it this morning, I was walking out on GMA, about what people eat when they're um, sad or depressed, I think it was. I missed what they said. But I think we all have our favorite foods. Um, we tend to, as a society, eat a lot of comfort slash processed foods. Um, processed foods are the enemy. Again, another take home message for today. Processed foods are the enemy. And this is another example of calories in versus calories out. You may have gone to the grocery store last night and picked up a, um, like a, a, some sort of low-cal frozen dinner for lunch today, or maybe like a soup or something like that. You're smiling. <laughs> it's exactly. <laughs> okay, so you're great because you've got your healthy calories. It may, because they're getting, you know, marketing is getting a little bit more, uh, they're catching on, and now it may even say, lower carbs, more protein, healthy fats, okay? So you've got it, you pop it in the microwave, you eat it, you feel good about yourself because you had your 250 calories, it's a well-balanced diet, except all of those added ingredients that are in it are stimulating hormonal changes in your body to signal fat storage, okay? And so the rule of thumb is that if it has more than five ingredients, don't eat it. More than five ingredients, don't eat it, okay? Um, and that's kind of hard to, to find. Um, I mean, if you, well, do you mind if I, ask, is it Sharon? Yes. Sharon, what, what type of meal is it? Like, what type of thing? Yeah, it's like the steam bowl, um, healthy choice, it's a, uh, I think it's chicken teriyaki. Or oh, something. with like the rice and everything? Yeah. Oh yeah, I used to actually eat those all the time. Now, what you can do is, and I know it's a little bit more work, you buy a, a rice cooker, which I just discovered this summer, which is like the best thing. Since that's right. Yeah, the rice cooker, and you cook up, take some frozen veggies, throw nothing wrong, frozen veggies, and I've done this with a rotisserie chicken, or um, all these actually I think is the best chicken in the world. But you just saute up some chicken, some vegetables, and throw it in your rice bowl, and bring it tomorrow. Same exact thing, in the long run it saves money, it's probably going to taste a little better, because it doesn't taste so artificial, and you're not going to have all those hormonal changes. Okay? So the foods that society has given us to make our life easier, which it does, I'm not, I'm not mocking that at all, but it's causing so many other, so much havoc, and I could have a whole two hour discussion on all the different ingredients and what they're doing, but just know that they, what happens is they stimulate um, changes in our DNA replication, which stimulates changes in hormones and genetic markers and so on and so forth. Processed foods are also, um, have the ability to uh, decrease the, body's utilization of our vitamins and minerals that we are consuming. So that healthy juice we had in the morning, it's getting wiped out by the processed food as far as the nutrient value. Um, also processed foods are highly linked to cancer. Okay, um, something as simple as a plastic bowl, it's microwave bin. Um, uh, it's all again, all those, art think of it, you're, you're eating food or eating particles that have been created in a plants, like in a, in a factory. We don't want that because our body knows that and it immediately stimulates inflammation and that leads to a whole bunch of other things. So the comfort foods that we're consuming is, is basically doing us in. Okay, so we've got this concept, um, this kind of newer term now called diabetes. So we've got this concept where we have obese individuals or overweight individuals and I think where it's harder to discover who's overweight versus obese because our, our natural um, thought process or what we consider being overweight has changed. I think our standards have, I guess, decreased, so to speak, where, you know, I, and I see this in the school. My daughter's in uh, fifth grade, you go to schools, and I would say that 60% of the kids would be considered overweight. But none of the kids, which I guess is good, around them realize they're overweight because our standards have changed, okay? But what's happening is it doesn't take much added weight to 
have precursors to diabetes. Okay. And so I saw this with my research where we had these healthy, of weight, normal weight individuals, their insulin levels increased significantly through the soda, plus, as I mentioned, the triglycerides. And what happens when you have elevated fats, even if you're not eating a lot of sugar, you have a lot of elevated bad fats, the fats get stored in the cell of the muscle, and that decreases the muscle's ability to take up sugar or glucose, and therefore your insulin levels stay elevated and you, it leads to diabetes. Okay, so elevated um, fats can lead to obesity, can lead to diabetes, can also, elevated sugars also lead to that. So we kind of have this new word that we're throwing out there now called diabetes. And again, it's just too many um, calories from fat, from sugar, from processed foods, not enough exercise. It's increasing our ability to um, store fat and, and not utilize insulin the way it should. We should. I'll skip that one, but um, it's basically just what diabetes is. And, and another thing too with the processed foods is because the processed foods are foreign to the body and the body stimulates this inflammatory response, the inflammatory response then stimulates the muscle to stop taking up glucose. And now you have elevated glucose. So they kind of all tie together. There is definitely a, a big genetic factor um, with obesity and diabetes, up to about 70%, which is pretty high, much higher than we originally thought. Now that doesn't mean that if you have an overweight parent that um, you're gonna be overweight. It means that you, you may be. It just means you have to work that much harder. I came from a, a very obese family. My mother's obese, everybody's obese. Grandparents, everybody. And the only reason, although by BMI charts I am considered overweight, is I really have to exercise and watch what I eat. Um, there's no doubt about it. And everyone's always like, oh, you're just blessed with good genes. Well, I came out of the same mother, the same father. Um, so, although interestingly, I was at a conference uh, last fall, I think. There's new research out now saying that if you're obese, and you have a child. Yes, if you're if the female's obese and you have a child, that child's at higher risk. Yes. So as a, a female that is in the childbearing years, it would make sense to try to lose weight and then get pregnant. But what they're discovering now is that if you were delivered C-section versus vaginally, it has a big impact on whether you're going to get that um, genetic makeup essentially of being obese and so what they found was that if you have an obese mother and she gives a vaginal birth you have a higher risk of becoming obese the child the baby and if you're c-section you're not and it's because of some of the um the um, hormones and and, and uh, antibodies that are released through a vaginal delivery you're basically delivering it and carrying it on your child so interestingly i asked my mom i'm like i told her sisters I'm like, I think I was the only one that was C-section. I mean, I know I was a C-section baby because my mom reminded me of it for, you know, 42 years. But anyways, my two sisters that are obese were not. And that just being totally coincidental. But my mom was obese for all of us. But I was a C-section. But I also, is I'm, of the three, I'm the only one that's really physically active, so that's probably it too. But just, you know, it's newer research that's coming out. It's kind of interesting. There's also... Um, that's a lot of epigenetics. This is, there's something called Nutra, uh, it's called Nutrigenetics, I think, and I actually have a webinar tomorrow on it. And that is about the foods that we consume and then pass on to our siblings. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I already said that the standard diet, American diet, is definitely killing us. Regardless of your weight, um, it will do you in, and that's really a big component of um, what I talk about in my student with my students. Because think about a college student coming in; all they want to do is eat garbage. They basically have all you can eat buffet, and they don't look at it from they just look at it from like looking in the mirror, you know. But in reality, all that food that they're serving is, is essentially killing them. And when I first got here in 2011. I worked with the registered dietitian at the time to put calories on, it was Cooper, I think. Cooper Dining, no, not Cooper Dining Hall. Pathfinder. 
that I had them put the calorie content of the foods for two weeks on the glass, and the students flipped out. I mean, we see it more now, but um, back then, so this was, you know, seven years ago, the students were like, I do not want to know. I don't want to know, just give it to me. <laughs> and so after two weeks, we had to take it off because everybody was flipping out over it. Um, I do know that there's an app that you can use for the dining halls that show it to you, but the students don't want to see that. I mean, I have to admit, we went to Cheesecake Factory uh, on, Chris on New Year's Eve. And, you know, I, I went in there knowing I was going to indulge. And I did not want to see, of course, Cheesecake Factory. It's one extreme to the next. But I didn't really want to see those calories on there. But when you're talking about a dining hall where you're eating someplace every day, three days a week, three times a day, you should be aware of what you're eating. And they don't want to know. They don't want to know. We already talked about sugar. Um, we already talked about this whole processed food. So again, it's not calories in versus calories out. It's processed food. It's convenience foods. It's too much of it. Yes, ingesting too many calories is going to get you to gain weight, but even if you're of normal weight in eating these foods, you're increasing your cholesterol, increasing your sugar levels, um, leading to this diabetes feed down the road. Um, and what we found is there's a lot of individuals that are of normal weight that have a lot of metabolic factors going on. Um, I have this, I added, uh, wheat today is not the wheat of yesterday. Um, I'm sure you guys have all kind of heard about the gluten-free diet and, you know, everyone's going gluten-free and why are they? Why do we see so many people that can't eat gluten anymore? So at first I thought it was just crazy moms. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Mainly because I saw it originally in my daughter's school, and you know, and I did a little research. And there's an amazing book called Wheat Belly. If you're interested in it, it's it's a great read, easy read. Wheat Belly, and it talks about this issue. And the issue is the wheat that we grew up in with is not the wheat that, that people have now that we have now. And what happens is the manufacturers want to produce more and more wheat. So what they're doing is they're genetically modifying it. And what happens when you genetically modify something is that now when you put it into your body, it's a foreign invader. And the body responds by stimulating inflammation, which stimulates, again, all these kind of downstream mechanisms where you're gaining weight, you're storing fat, you're altering your DNA, and you're leading to a lot of gut issues um, and a lot of uh, neurological issues. So when somebody says they can't eat gluten and you think they're, you know, full of BS, it's possible because it's not, it's different now than it was before. It's completely, the, the, the actual wheat itself is made artificially now, unfortunately. My husband discovered about two years ago, he was, he was really sensitive to garlic. He got worse when he got older, he was tolerant of it. But then other things were doing the same thing that didn't have any garlic in it. And he did some research, and it wasn't the wheat flour, it was the malted barley flour that they used, because apparently it's cheaper, so they cut yes, it. Yes, so I'm Processed baked goods, yep. and you buy at Wegmans or wherever, right. have malted barley. It's very hard, because you have to go organic if you don't want Right, that's barley. interesting. So, and he, he said that it's a ingredient called Italy. So it's in garlic oh, and malted yes. barley flour. Oh, yes, And chicory root or whatever. Yep. So Italy, and that's the biggest, you know, it's easier, but again, Cut down on processed food because you know, like any jar of sauce has garlic powder, right? Right, right. Jar That's sauce. really interesting. But that was so. I think some people who think they're sensitive to gluten, I wonder if they're actually sensitive. Right. To gluten. And I will tell you that there's only one way to find out, and that's the limited. So and inulin is interesting because it is considered a probiotic, mm -hmm. so it's put in a lot of foods right. to make it healthier. It's brought. It's again a processed uh, way for the the manufacturers to make their food seem healthier. Exactly. And general purpose flour, when you just, I, I made this mistake, this was my discovery last week, when you just buy general purpose Wegmans flour off the shelf, it has, it's not 100% wheat flour. You actually have to look for one that has the malted barley flour. Right, so right. I had a bag of flour I couldn't use. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, so I actually had to go and buy the more, And you, you know, wouldn't know unless you, yeah. You have to really, so that's actually, I've been reading a lot of labels since he kind of did this research and figured it out. And, and when it comes down to it, uh, yeah, and when it comes down to it, it goes back to whole foods. Right. If you can just eat natural whole foods. Right. So if I make baked goods at home, you're right, then yeah. I know. But if, yeah. you, if you buy processed ones, they almost fall. Exactly. 
Yeah, and again, it takes a trial and error. Um, there is a lot of research about gut health and that type of stuff. So all these processed foods are killing our healthy bacteria in our gut. And the purpose of that healthy bacteria is it's eliminating or it's killing these bad foods or bad particles that's in our food so that it doesn't get into our bloodstream and then you excrete it out. Well, if you're ingesting food that's killing our good bacteria in our gut, all the bad stuff can filter right into our bloodstream. So things like fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, a lot of the um, lupus, um, a lot of conditions that are associated with inflammation could, I, I could seriously say, you probably could reverse it by just eliminating a lot of these artificial um, foods. And, and like you said, it may not be meat, it might be inulin, it might be, well, who knows? Um, so there's just, it, it's again, it's not a calorie is a calorie, you know. We already know about causes of obesity. Um, one thing I do want to mention is uh, sleep. Uh, I think sleep is that kind of factor that a lot of people think, eh, I'd rather stay up and, you know, finish this, creating these, instead of getting my sleep. But hormonally, probably one of the best things that you can do, or worst things you can do for your body is to not get enough sleep. Okay, so if you don't get enough sleep, it increases a lot of hormones, so specifically cortisol is increased, and that's a hormone that if it stays elevated, it, started, it uh, takes fat and stores it, okay? And so sleep, this is um, something that I really, really owned out on with my college students. Um, and, and you know, everyone's like, well, how much sleep do I need? You know, it, it varies. For, from person to person, um, but I mean, generally speaking, seven eight hours. But you know that might not be possible. I I have no problem getting up at five thirty in the morning to work out, but I definitely just make sure that I'm in bed by like nine thirty, which is fine with me. So definitely sleep. Another thing is, um, and you may have noticed this if you really lack sleep. Next time, I notice it right away. If you have a really bad night's sleep, notice how hungry you are the next day. And what happens is if you don't get enough sleep, your body stimulates our hunger hormone, which is ghrelin. So think of ghrelin as growling. It's what causes that ghrelin. Um, but lack of sleep stimulates or increases ghrelin hormones and causes us to eat more, be hungry more often. Um, and then typically when you're hungry, and you're groggy, you typically go to the sugary, you know, foods with the coffee and that type of stuff. And we know not to skip breakfast. Um, there's a lot with intermittent fasting now and all that, but, you know, throw it out the window. Just don't skip breakfast. And I flipped that on my daughter this morning because it was 8.05, the bus comes at 8.10, and it came out somehow that she didn't eat breakfast. And I'm like, I will drive you to school. You are not skipping breakfast. And I understand some people just don't like breakfast, but you need to eat something because what happens is if you go from, say, 7 o'clock at night, sleep all day, or all night, excuse me, get up at, say, 6 in the morning, you've gone 12, 11, 12, 13 hours without eating, your body needs to know, it needs to basically trust you. So you need to tell your body, I'm going to give you food. And you give it something because if you don't give food to your body, it again hormonally starts to say, wait a minute, I don't know what I'm gonna eat again. I'm going in starvation mode and it starts to pull down the fat. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, it could be, you know, again, I, I, I'm gonna say granola bar and I just spent the last 20 minutes saying don't eat processed foods. But if it's that or nothing, I mean, maybe eat a banana or something. Um, on the banana note, before I forget, when I talk about sugar and fructose, I just want to state that fruit is not the problem. Okay, so everyone's like, well, if we can't eat fructose, we can't eat fruit. In order for the amount of fructose that's in a piece of fruit, even a banana, to have a harmful effect on you, you have to eat five to 10 in one sitting. So fruit is not your enemy. No one has ever gotten overweight from eating too much fruit. Okay, so just FYI. 
All right, so we already talked about diet sweeteners. What do you think? Should we should we eat sweeteners? I mean, I saw a whole. I was at um, a dietetics um, conference in September, and there was a whole entire presentation about. It's called Eversweet. It's basically what tru uh, Truvia, Truvia is that what's called? Truvia right. is being replaced by. It's the same company. And I um, heard this whole spiel about how great it is. And then I realized, I guess I was sitting too far away to realize what the guy had on his shirt. And it was, um, I forget the name of the company. Is it Nabisco? I can't remember, but he works for the company. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, no. Are you going to put something in your body that has been processed in a factory? And then, of course, everyone's like, well, Truvia, is that what's called? Truvia? Truvia? Truvia. Truvia. It's natural, all natural. Sure. It's, it's real. It's from the real plant. Well, it is. And that's what this guy was telling us. It's from the plant, except out of the whole plant, they use 1% of the plant. So of this leaf, they use 1% of it. But then he even said to be able to make it economically feasible, they create all this other artificial stuff to go with it to make it so that it's sweet enough or not sweet. I guess the issue with um, trivia is it's bitter. I've never had it. So they came out with Eversweet um, and they do all this um, fermentation, they call it. And so the guy, I mean, he had me and I, I know this stuff pretty well, but I had followed for it until I researched it more. He goes through this whole fermentation process about how they take 1% of the leaf and turn it into all this sugar. And he used the example of it's no different than fermenting beer. So I found it really interesting um, that it, it's, it's the fact that, I know there's a session here right after us. Um, it's interesting that even the manufacturer had kind of stumped me, but after researching it more, no artificial stuff, nothing. So this was a conference. Yeah, it was actually, um, and, and you can Google Eversweet and, it'll, and look for the video, a YouTube video, mm -hmm. and it'll talk, it'll tell you, I mean, it looks spot on, like legit. Right, but I would like, you, as an economist, if I went to an economics conference and they had someone in there to give a presentation that worked for like a company or something, that person would be stoked. Yeah. I mean, well, honestly, so academics get really angry about This that. is the interesting part, Okay. is the conference, and I, I know this is being recorded, but. Um, <laughs> or put a spot. It was. 12,000 registered dietitians. Okay. Um, and most of them, if I had to say a guess, most of them are in clinical practice, they're not right. academics. Right. I happened to have been in DC at the time and stopped in, so was, I got a day pass, and I really just wanted to go to their food expo show, right. which is actually where I saw the video, because it's the most, I mean, you can fill up for days just going through the expo show, but it's all, one, I would say 80% of the, um, conference is all processed foods. And that's typically dietitians focus more on calories in versus calories out. Right. So that from a researcher who's focused more on whole foods, I the whole time was like, go punch anyone. Just settle down. Because I did get in a big argument a couple years ago with the uh, Gatorade people because of things they were saying. That That's for another day. <laughs> So yeah, it was interesting that I was there. I shouldn't have been there. I was, there was no place for me there. <laughs> we talked about the grains and how it's not the same. Um, I just want to get into all this we've already talked about. I can share these slides. Um, basically, what do you do? So as we're winding down, because I know there's another session coming in, um, and I can share these slides with you, but what is it that you do? What's the take-home message here? Well, the first take home message is don't eat processed foods. Don't think a calorie is a calorie. Exercise more, but eat less. Okay, but a couple other things. Boost your nutrition. Okay, so you want to make sure that your nutrition is whole food, natural nutrition. It doesn't have to necessarily be organic, although depending on your situation, it might help. There's nothing wrong with um, frozen vegetables or fruit. Okay, uh, I wouldn't go with the canned because it knows our process. So my thought is if you take a piece of food and you can set it on your counter and it looks exactly the same five days later, you shouldn't be eating it. Okay, so something as simple as lunch meat. Yes, 
lunch meat can be bad, but if you're eating, if you're going to the deli and you're getting, you know, plain though roasted turkey, it's going to be fine. Think about how that tastes five days later. It tastes disgusting. You can tell it's not processed because it doesn't last. Whereas if you buy the turkey, sliced turkey, where they sell like the hot dogs and everything, you can eat that a year from now probably. Okay, so as you think of your food, it needs to be healthy, it needs to be bright, and it needs to not be able to sit on your counter for more than five days. Okay? Um, regulate your hormones. A lot of that is good sleep, physical activity, and eating, again, a healthy, moderate um, food. Reduce inflammation. We talked about the gut issues, and a lot of these processed foods are stimulating inflammation. Improve digestion. Um, lots of ways you can do this, but and I, this is you know me basically telling you something that I don't do myself. But really, the best thing as far as improving your digestion is to sit down and holistically eat your meal. Don't eat it in front of the TV. Don't eat it in the car. I say this because when I'm working, I think I eat breakfast and lunch like walking around or in my car, okay? You want to sit down, have a space to eat, eat slowly, and really um, know what you're eating instead of just piling it in your mouth as you're driving, okay? Because that really disrupts digestion. Sleep we talked about, enhanced energy and metabolism. Um, again, that goes a lot into exercise, so I, exercise is definitely important. Soothe the mind. Um, I am doing a, uh, a I'm, I'm working on this certification, this health coach certification right now, and I have to do this webinar, and it's called Organize Your Mind, and it's, I thought it was total BS, and it's amazing. It's all about the different, there's 14 brain states, and the way the brain interacts, or something as simple as how it responds to a blue wall versus a white wall can stimulate certain hunger hormones and all these crazy things. Um, so staying relaxed, reducing your stress, and kind of living in the present mo moment helps a lot. Move, you know, we need to move. Move doesn't necessarily mean you need to go to the gym every day. It's something as simple as, you know, I, I worked out this morning, great, but then instead of, I was originally gonna just park here, instead I still parked where I normally park and park and walk over. Because even though I exercised this morning, I still like to move. I think everybody, it should be like, as soon as you come out of the womb, your, your mother or father gives you a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something. I do actually, in all seriousness, think all college students should be given one with admissions. Um, i got another minute here. So um, what I just wanted to kind of wrap up with was this bounce program. I didn't do the presentation to promote the class. I do this presentation every January. But this year, just out of um, people coming up to me, they asked if I wanted to do a class. So I am going to give it a whirl. Um, I teach a bounce class for students. They get it for credit. It's college credit for faculty and staff. I can't give you college But anyways, what this class is, is it's a 12-week behavior change program. It is not a Weight Watchers. It is really where we sit down and we individually talk, we talk as a group, and we focus on what is it that's making you make these changes, or not make these changes, okay? It's 80% you talking, 20% me talking, okay? Um, and we focus on, there's actually a curriculum. I have a curriculum that I developed myself with a bariatric physician from Syracuse, and um, each week it focuses on something else, and it all, focuses on not me giving you information, which I do, but it's you looking at how, what is it that you're gonna do that week to change your behavior in order to implement this knowledge that I gave you, okay? Um, I, you get with it body fat testing if you want it, resting metabolic rate if you want it. That's really funny, it tells me to get up and stand. So much for my Apple Watch. <laughs> anyway, um, body fat testing, resting metabolic rate, and you also get cholesterol testing. Um, the cholesterol testing, I do have to charge an extra $10 because the cassettes cost money. 
But if you're interested, um, I have flyers here for people online. You just send me an email. I'm going to promote this throughout campus. And it'll start February 5th from 12 to 1. Um, and that's that. Where, where will it be? I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> to be determined. So if you're interested for the people online and in the class, I do have flyers if you want it. But if not, um, just send me an email. I'll give you more information. All right, thanks guys, thank you. Sorry we didn't have time for questions, but please email me with any questions.